So it says it's recording. <clears throat> All right, so I wanted to uh, go over some parts. Uh, we'll start in chapter seven on the skeleton. <clears throat> so I think what we'll do is we'll start it from um, uh, cranium or uh, the skull down. And there's a lot to learn here, but as we're learning it, try to think about um, these markings, what might attach to them, if there's a foramen or a meatus or some kind of opening, you know, what is it for? Is it for um, arterial, is it for a vein, is it for a cranial nerve? And remember too, and I'll try to mention again, the cranial nerves are numbered one through 12 from superior to inferior, all right, starting with uh, cranial nerve one all right, for, for smell, um, and then ending with cranial nerve 12, hypoglossal for the tongue and some of the, um, yeah, for right now, just most of the tongue and some of the neck muscles, but um, right now we'll just say for the tongue. I'm sorry, it is just for tongue, sorry. It's uh, motor only, okay? So the skeletal system or skeleton is composed of bones, cartilage, joints, ligaments. So remember, cartilage, we have cartilage like in the uh, temporal mandibular joint. That's gonna be for articulation. We want it's coming up a smooth surface. Um, <clears throat> so this can glide or um, motion. And you know, we will need those joints there. Uh, and ligaments, remember ligaments, join bone to bone, tendons join muscle to bone. Right? So the skeletal system or skeleton is mostly bone. Cartilage occurs at isolated areas, like there's costal cartilage, there's cartilage in your intervertebral um, joints, uh, ligaments connect bones and reinforce joints. And remember too, if you're going into healthcare, once you strain, strain or strain something, right? If you um, strain it, there's generally muscle. If you, um, yeah, if you strain it, it's generally ligament. And once these ligaments are stretched, remember the, the, the tissues, elastin and all these, these um, fibrin tissues, once you stretch them, they don't want to come back to the original shape. So usually there's gonna be some instability around that joint or instability around the, the, um, where the bones articulate. So the skeleton accounts for 20% of body mass. And remember, I just, uh, last chapter or so, we were talking about bones. Remember, these are very, very metabolically active. All right, so we're gonna divide the um, two major divisions, the axial skeleton and appendicular. When we talk about appendicular, we talk about appendages. So that would be like your arms uh, and legs. And we'll get into, you know, arm, forearm, thigh, and all those different uh, portions. But right now, I'll just start thinking up of your um, appendage you know, kind of just do it, arms and legs, right? So like I said, we'll try not to make a mistake on the video or misspeak, but if I do, um, if you want, you can go into the YouTube channel and just leave a comment and I can maybe add another tube chopper or something. Tube chopper there. All right, so the axial skeleton, remember this is gonna be, you know, down the sagittal plane and midline. All right, the axial skeleton consists of 80 bones divided into three major regions. So we're going to talk today about the skull, then we'll go into the vertebral column and then the thoracic cage. So the vertebral column is that vertical column and it's going to um, encase your spinal cord. So the skull and the vertebral column are going to be primarily portions of the osseous tissue that's going to encase the central nervous system. So it'll be your, your brain and your spinal cord. So the axial skeleton has um, three functions. So it forms longitudinal, axis of the body, so that's that longitudinal axis, right? Supports the head, neck, and the trunk. Tremendous amount of weight, right? So think about that, um, if anyone's gone bowling, all right? So a bowling ball can be anywhere from eight to, I don't know, 14 pounds or whatever. But that's the weight of your, your cranium. So your neck has to support all that. And a lot of us walk around with, with forward head carriage, so our head is going forward, puts a tremendous amount of sprain, stain, sprain and strain on your cervical spine, your neck muscles, and that can contribute to you know, neck pain, um, shoulder pain, uh, posterior shoulder pain, um, and just a lot of stress, migraines, um, and things like that. Right? So it protects the brain, the spinal cord, and the thoracic organs. So think of your thoracic organs would be that mid body, so you know, obviously, I mean, obviously, your heart, lungs, 
I guess your diaphragm you could put in there. <clears throat> Ooh, water. All right, so there's from your book, here's some of the, the, um, the bones. And I have with me today, I, I grabbed some um, skull models. I actually have one real skull model, um, which is pretty cool, because um, you can't get them anymore. And then I have some plastic colored ones, and then I have um, an exploded skull, so we can pull it all apart. But here's some of the, the muscle, or the bones in the body. So just start, um, when you're memorizing these, just kind of start visualizing what are they articulating like? What are they um, butting up against, all right? And kind of remember, whenever you have bones uh, articulating, Generally, not always, there's going to be some kind of cartilaginous uh, tissue there. Right. And we'll get into the details of this uh, after we, we get the skull, because there's a tremendous amount in the skull. And <clears throat> we're going to learn these bones. And then when you learn about muscles, facial muscles, or muscles of facial expression, a lot of these, these bony landmarks are going to be where these muscles attach. So when you're studying, Take your time, repetition is key, and start looking these things up or do a real quick Google search um, and realize what are they articulating or you know, um, what is that uh, cell turcica? What is that just gonna be sitting in there? I start thinking about all these things because we're gonna go over them and over them again and again and again, uh, repetition. So please, as a word of whatever, um, please don't think that you can just sit down and memorize a couple of sheets of paper and get through a and p and even if you get through a and p when you go on to something else you're going to have to really start applying that it's going to be some critical thinking and a lot of students uh they lose they lose um or they, they're not going to lose it they are, they're unable to uh do critical thinking easily because they haven't been training their mind to do it all right so get in the practice of doing it So the skull is uh, most complex bony structure in the body. All right. So uh, when we look at the skull, there's a tremendous, and I mean tremendous amount of bony landmarks and foramen and holes, you know, foramen rotunda, foramen valley, um, a lot of these things. And you have to start thinking, well, what the carotid artery has to go through these structures? I mean, your brain's going to sit in there. You know, you've got the different lobes of your brain. You've got the pituitary gland external uh, acoustic meatus for your ear and all those nerves that are going for um, hearing and balance, things like that. So it's, you have to start thinking about this a little bit at a time and then kind of visualize in 3D how to pull these things together. So the cranial bone or cranium, you close the brain and the, and the cranial cavity, provide sites for attachment of neck uh, and head muscles. All right, and then <clears throat> please also keep in mind if you guys uh, have me or if you're taking pathophys or some kind of, uh, when you're, you're going to do um, neurology or whatever, just realize if there is inflammation or septic infection in the brain and the dura mater, or pia mater, and that fluid, as it expands, it's going to stretch those tissues and cause a lot of pain. But also remember, too, if there's some kind of um, growth or some, you know, we hate to think of brain cancer. Um, Something, some kind of mitotic division of the supportive glial cells or astrocytes or whatever, um, and it starts uh, growing, there's no place for this to expand to. So it has to, once it hits the, the cranium, it, as the mass grows, it's going to be compressing the t tissues surrounding it or deep to it. And then we start getting into the brain centers and not a great, great thing. Right? So the facial bones, uh, we'll start superficial, and then we'll kind of go to the, you know, the base of the skull. We'll start going to the superior portion of the skull on the inside and just start learning some of these landmarks and what attaches to them. All right. So it forms the framework of the face. Contains uh, cavities for special sense organs for your sight, you know, optic nerve, um, taste for the tongue, I have a glossal and smell olfactory, which is going to move one. Um, provides opening for air and, and food passage. So, you know, let's talk about the, the conchi and the septum. Uh, 
you know, how the turbulence of the air and uh, food passage using the tongue and down the esophagus. So it secures the teeth. We're going to learn about the alveolar sockets, um, the gomphosis, the maxillary bone, and the uh, mandible. Most uh, skull bones are flat and, and firmly locked together, except for the mandible. All right, so the, as you look, oh, this is actually the real skull. All right, you can see how thin and more or less thin and flat by flat like that. These are joined by sutures, and I don't know if I can get up close enough to that for you guys. Maybe you can see. Maybe I'll hang on a second. Here. Eliminate some of those. Hopefully, this will show up on the video. All right. They have a serrated saw tooth appearance, so like a serrated knife or, um, well, you, I'm assuming you all know what a saw looks like, right? So there's kind of these um, squamous sutures, right? And there's coronal, named by the plane it's in, right? Sagittal, transverse, coronal, remember all those. There's a lambdoidal suture, all right? So that is lambda, Greek letter. That's how they named it. There's some of your facial bones, right, maxillary, mandible, TMJ, temporal mandibular joint in there. Facial bones from the anterior aspect of the, cran the cranium forming the rest of the skull. Right, cranium would be uh, the part encasing the brain. Cranium is divided into a vault and a base. Right? Cranial vault, cavera, forms superior. So if you were superior in here. It's the back. It's posterior. Superior, lateral, and then the potential on the posterior portion of the skull as well as the forehead or your, where your frontal lobe is. The cranial base forms the inferior aspect of the skull. Generally, the base is divided into three steps. We're sort of anterior, middle, and posterior. So just kind of realize what's sitting in that. So anterior is going to be your frontal lobe. Middle, it's going to be the apparatus for the hearing. A posterior is going to be um, where your occipital lobe is going to be sitting. Brain sits within these fossa and closed by a cranial vault. Right? So the area is referred to as a cranial cavity. So I'll just briefly, if I have a skull here, take it off. Oh. All right, so this is anterior, posterior. So if I flip this up, this is still going to be anterior. Anterior here with your frontal lobe, medial, posterior. Oh, that's a little bit. All right, and there is a picture right out of your book. Mr. Gale right there. Middle lobe, what's your foramen magnum? All right, means big hole, and that's going to be your spinal cord's going to be coming through. Posterior cranial fossa in here is going to be where your occipital lobe of the brain is going to be uh, sitting. Okay. There's the anterior cranial fossa, the frontal lobes. And, you know, if you look, there's a division here, so we know or we will learn that you have a left and right um, frontal lobe, or you might have heard the term left brain or right brain, depending on which. So the brain you identify with more, um, yeah, identify with, right? So left brain people generally are going to be very analytical, very science-based. Right brain people generally, you could say they're either musical or creative, um, much more spatial concepts, all right, in general. Right, here's a lateral view with cutaway. So there, once again, there's your frontal lobe. Some of your personality, intellect, things like that. And we'll learn this. All right. <clears throat> There's your cerebellum. Right, for balance, occipital lobe is back here. Here's your temporal lobe. All right. So temporal is going to be on the posterior side. And temporal means time. All right. So if you, um, they, they name that because men, as they are 40 or older, 
that area starts graying. Right? So they just, so with time, that gray is what call it the temporal lobe. All right, so just kind of get orientated anterior, posterior, and a general idea of what's going on. There's all these sulci in here. And realize too, there's gonna to be cerebral spinal fluid floating all around in here. Cranium also contains other cavities, middle and internal ear cavities. There's gonna be in the middle portion of that. The nasal cavity, and we'll see that from the anterior, all right? And orbits that house the eyes, uh, balls or eye sockets. Skull has 85 named openings. Don't worry, you have to know them all. all right. Foramina, canals, and fissures. So these are going to be openings. Foramina are usually tiny. Fissures are generally not round. They're going to be more oval in general. All right. Provide passage for a spinal cord, major blood vessels, and the 12 cranial nerves. And once again, when you start learning these cranial nerves, we're going to back up. All right. They're going to be named. Um, from superior to inferior, ending with cranial nerve 12 here, cranial nerve 1 here for um, olfactory. So just keep that in mind, it'll make um, learning them a little easier. All right, so here's your cranial cavity, orbit for the eye, and you see these are bilateral, and your oral cavity. All right, so we're going to start learning all of these um, structures or um, names of these components. So the cranium is composed of eight cranial bones. All right, so luckily we have some of these that I ordered for us. All right. These are all going to be, or they are all color-coded. Reminds me of, you guys know who Ahmed is? Jeff Dunham? Yeah. Right. <clears throat> so the frontal bone, parietal bones, and then those are bilateral. And so we only have one frontal, we have bilateral uh, parietal bones. Occipital bone is going to be on the back here. It's going to be covering the occipital lobe. Cerebellum is going to be down here. Temporal bones, right, temporal, remember it means time. That's where men gray, usually. All right, sphenoid bone. We'll be looking at it from here in F. Right, so, you know, I mean, you may have heard of the sphenoid sinuses or ethmoid sinuses and the components of that bony area. So the frontal bone, or, you know, if you want to say like uh, somebody had a frontal lobotomy, which was not a good thing, but they would go in, drill in there, and they just kind of take a probe and move it all around. It completely changed people's personalities. Right. So the frontal bone is shell, Shell-shaped bone forms anterior and posterior cranium. The vertical part called the squamous region is also known as the forehead, right? And you know, we talked about squamous cells, um, but these are usually, they mean like scale-like or tile-like, all right? So when they named it, um, I can show you guys here. It would be up in here. I'm actually transluminating a real skull. You can see how thin that is because the light's going right through it. The uh, inferior portion ends at the supraorbital margin. So supraorbital. Right, supra means always above. This is the orbital. So supraorbital. So there's your orbital. So supra orbital would be above the eye. Area underneath the eyebrow forms the superior wall of the orbits and most of the anterior cranial fossa. Right, so anterior So the supraorbital foramen allows supraorbital artery to nerve to pass through the forehead. This one I don't see it. Ah, beautiful. So I'm trying to see if I can like, pop this thing. Let's see if I can do it. They're literally right here. I could literally, if I wanted to, put my pipe cleaner right through that. Oh my God, I did. So I did have a pipe cleaner right through. This is a real skull. I have the pipe cleaner right through that. Okay. <clears throat> 
And the glabella, I'll use this one. Glabella is right here, the area of the funnel bone between the orbits. Funnel sinuses are located just lateral to the glabella. Your funnel sinus is here. Um, and I guess I don't know if I could. Yeah, maybe I won't. But that's also, um, you know, some people, spiritual people have that dotted, all right? It's right over the third eye. If you are interested in any of that, that uh, stuff. And posterior to that's going to be the pituitary gland directly in line with that. So this will keep popping up. So just start looking at this. Um, and, you know, obviously your patient's not going to have color-coded bones, but just kind of getting an idea of where these boundaries are and what, um, you know, optic canal, what's going through there. Well, I would think it's going right to the eye. All right, so the optic nerve, cranial nerve two is going to go through there, the superior orbital fissure. So we have to innervate the eye, right? So we're going to have some blood vessels and things like that. So as you're going through here, look at your book um, and start, it'll tell you what's going through it and then think, well, yeah, we have to innervate that. We have to get blood to it. We have to move blood away from it. A lot of nerve roots and things like that. Our nerves are going to be going through there. So here is a superior to inferior view, S to I, just showing you some of these components. Here's the cribriform foramen, optic canal, all right, foramen ovale, spinosum. I got my phone right here. So this is going to be a, there's going to be some uh, cranial nerves going in here, through here, all right. Internal acoustic meatus. So this would be have to do with something with the ear, right? So if you're talking about no, think, well, what cranial nerve innervates the ear, all right? Um, so I'm not gonna tell you that, you can look it up and then you'll remember. Right? So just start thinking of, you know, why do they name these, these um, landmarks, these certain things? There's a hypoglossal canal for cranial nerve 12, all right, so you innervate your tongue, your tongue muscles. And here's a uh, view from, and that look, looks pretty much like a real skull, actually. I can tell because it's so thin. It's, yeah, it's so thin. All right, and the other thing is here, and I showed you on the other um, <coughs> skull here. Just think about this for a second. I'm going to transluminate that. Transluminate that. So I have a pen light. I'm going to go through the eye socket and see how thin that is. And some of these membranes are super thin. So you had a systemic infection in your, um, your bloodstream, all right, if, it, if there was enough pressure, it could just um, go through that or if enough pressure it would actually break that very thin membrane, you could, all, you, you could get that uh, systemic infection into the cerebral spinal fluid and that can cause um, some major, major problems. Because antibiotics, it's a little harder to get antibiotics into the cerebral spinal fluid. Um, just like with meningitis, all right, it's uh, inflammation of the meninges, and that can be life-threatening in a matter of hours. All right, so you know, start learning the, the signs of that. You know, people would be uh, telling you it came on super sudden, the most intense headache they've ever had in their life. They're going to be in Koenig position with their knees flexed. You go to straighten them out, they're going to be in a lot of pain. You don't want to take all the the pressure off that. Um, the dura mater, pia mater, and the spinal cord, because it, it, there's so much pressure building up in it, they're expanding that, causing the headache, all right? And if you uh, were to straighten out, you're putting more tension on that, very, very, very painful, telltale sign. Right. The two parietal bones form most of the superior and lateral aspects of the cranial vault. Right. There's four sutures, remember those are gonna be the um, saw-like, um, structures right, where these these uh, bones come together. Right, which the primal bone, the frontal, occipital, and temporal bones. Right, coronal. Right, so the, the, depending on the orientation of the bones, or something more coronal. Well, where we, what kind of section is that when we're talking about that in chapter one? All right, sagittal. Right between the right and left, 
so sagittal, like a sagittal um, plane, coronal, realize the, the um, orientation of that, lambdoidal between the parietal and occipital bone, and remember we said that lambdoidal um, shape in the Greek letter, and squamous uh, sutures are between the parietal and temporal bones on each side. Right. So these names will give you um, landmarks or, or give you a hint as to where they're located. Right. So there's coronal, there's the squamous, right, and there's lambdoidal just by the shape of it. Okay. There's a sagittal like the sagittal plane. So all right, so you have to think, well, wait a minute, is this anterior or posterior? Well, this is actually posterior. Posterior, look, from P to A, posterior to anterior. There's your occipital condyle. All right, this is how your, your skull is going to articulate with um, C1 or cervical vertebrae. External occipital crust. So there's going to be attachments for a lot of these neck muscles, or the ligament and niche, uh, is, um muscles that attach to keep your eyes on the horizon. It's called the writing reflex. Keeps your eyes uh, completely at the 180 on the horizon. So depending on your posture, how you're walking, or curvature of your spine, or if you're supinated or pronated, anything. So your, your eyes always want to be on the horizon. So they will do whatever it takes to keep that, it's like a balance, a navigation system, keeping your eyes level. <clears throat> so here is similar to what I have here. Just similar, just colored differently. All right. The view of the uh, skull from the lateral aspect. And there's one on the that looks to be real. Yeah. Wow, that's awesome. Now we've taken the same skull and we've done a sagittal cut on this. And it'll show you right here. If you're not sure, like, well, that looks weird. Or I'm new to this. And to, what, the, what the hell did they just do there? Just go and look. They'll show you. They put a, it looks like a piece of glass. They're cutting it right in half for you. Midline. So now you're getting a view. So theoretically, the mirror of that would be on the other side. So just realize, well, you guys kind of know, well, my ears over here somewhere. And you know, we have to have internal acoustic meatus. Meatus is whole, right? Acoustic, well, it sounds like sound to me, right? So just realize that um, this may be, you know, for just think, well, what is it for sound or is it for a cranial nerve? And just go in and read up on that. Right? Salturcica and on the sphenoid side is Salturcica means Turkish saddle, and there's going to be a very, very important endocrine organ sitting in there. All right, so if you do a radiograph or an x-ray and <clears throat> that's diminished or not there, you have something called empty, um, um, empty saddle syndrome, all right? So think about this. So actually, I'll tell you right now, the pituitary gland sits in there. So if your pituitary gland is uh, atrophied, um, it's not going to be, you know, if they find this in an infant or um, an adult, something that could be cancerous or something, that can be very, very devastating. Right? And if it's an infant, it's not sustainable with life. Failure to thrive. If it's an adult, they're going to have major, major endocrine disruptions. So they may be on um, endocrine uh, therapy the rest of their life if they can correct and figure out what the problem is. Occipital bone is going to be the most posterior, right, superior to the cerebellum. Forms most of the skull's posterior wall and posterior cranial fossa. <clears throat> and articulates with the parietal, temporal, and sphenoid bones. So it's just saying, you know, what does it articulate with? So you can see here, oh, sorry, in the color, what is it articulating with? Right. What is it brushing up against? So if it was a a country or a state, what would be its borders? What would it, would it be butting up against the articulations? Frame and magnum is large hole. All right, so there is the frame and magnum. All right, so the brain connects the spinal cord, flanked by a pair of occipital condyles. Right. Here and here, 
This is what sits on your um, spine and allows you to nod your head. Yes. So it's going to be kind of like a, an egg on a spoon. It has this um, rotational um, glide to it. All right. The hypoglossal canal allows cranial nerve 12 to pass through. And remember I said they go from superior to inferior. So cranial nerve 12 is going to be all the way at the very, very base or bottom. And that's going to articulate your tongue muscles. And once again, uh, it's purely motor. So some of these cranial nerves are sensory and motor. So sensory means they're going to, they're going to have receptors for something very, very specific. Some of them are strictly for... Um, motor skills. So your brain's going to, the homunculus is going <clears> to <throat> send a brain signal down um, through those cranial nerves to these muscles to get them to um, formulate or, um, or to um, yeah, formulate or control swallowing, organize control of swallowing, orchestrate, yeah. Okay. External occipital protuberance. All right. Protrusion just um, superior to the foramen magnum. So literally, it's right here. This pain in your side. I hope I don't have any pain in my muscles. All right, so right there. All right. <clears throat> Ridges that are cipher the ligament nuchae. So that ligament nuchae is neck. So it's going to attach ligaments there. All right, so. Um, if you've ever seen like um, some mammals or mother cats how they pick their, their kittens up, they pick them up from the back of the neck. It's very, very durable attachment. They pick them up from the ligament nuchae. Superior and inferior neutral lines, sort of attachment of many neck and back muscles. So on many of these um, neck muscles are gonna attach here in the back muscles. Um, to control the movement of your head. And like I said, that writing reflex, keep your eyes on the horizon. Right? So a lot of people that have, or most, most of the population I would say now, because of our cell phones and computers and um, tablets and uh, just the way we operate now, they're gonna have a lot of spring and strain on here and a lot of um, hypertonic, so overly tense muscles because they're constantly being used. Uh, and we've, you know, a lot of us or people don't know how to relax. So unless you're going in for um, a massage or whatever, and just kind of consciously relaxing those muscles, they just stay contracted. And when we start talking about the cross bridge theory, later on, we'll go into hypertonicity and things like that. And so here is your posterior view again. So superior nuchal line, all right, so this, this is the superior above, all right, here's your inferior, right? so this is going to be where a lot of those neck muscles or strap muscles attach. Okay, so if you haven't figured it out right now, <clears throat> this is from inferior to superior, all right, so we're looking from um, your palate up, right, but what's missing is this guy, the mandible. So taking the mandible off. So it would be this view with this removed. I don't really want to remove that. Okay. A lot of the students remove this and then I have to go and place the springs on them. Actually quite annoying. All right, so um, just kind of go in and Look at these. This is really, you know, honestly, this is more of a lab exercise, but I'm going to cover it in lecture and pop this into lab because uh, I don't, I, I can't be sure that if you don't have lab with me that this stuff is, is covered. I really, um, I, love, I really thoroughly think that your lecture in lab um, should be. Um, uh, synerg they should work synergistically together. Right? Shouldn't really be completely separate, but sometimes you know labs are full or lectures full, and you have to jump in somewhere else. All right. So when you're learning these, I'm going to ask you to or just suggest possibly that you take the extra minute. Like I said, you guys—I mean guys and girls—have um, 
have the ability to go in and Google search this. When I learned all this back before some of you were probably born, we had to literally go in and if we didn't know what it was, we had to go to the index, find that page and then search for it. Very, very time consuming. So you literally can go in, you can Google search. So you can study on one thing or have your um, cell phone and your tablet or your laptop or whatever you're doing and just go back and forth and just the fact that you're typing it in, you're gonna kind of learn the spelling and it's gonna bring it up. You can get another picture of it or another description of the same thing and it'll give you another um, image to, to capture in your head so you can remember that in the future. Right? So there's a difference between colored and plain. All right. So we were lucky in grad school, we literally had all real bones, all real skulls, real, um, actually real human brains. So we have to out look at all that really cool stuff. So the temporal, remember I said temporal means time. So start thinking about like with me where I'm graying in here. Um, <clears throat> paired bones that make up uh, inferior lateral. So what does that word mean? Inferior means lower, lateral means side. Aspects of the skull and parts of the uh, cranial base. And the other thing I want to remind you, just popped in my head, when you are looking at this or researching it, read it very slowly. What are they saying? Or if you don't know a word, just literally Google it and figure it out. Because these words um, can pop up again. Or when you're taking a board exam or NCLEX or something that's really, really important, you don't want to have a brain freeze and go, oh my God, what does that mean? I can't remember. Well, you can figure it out if you look at the word and break it apart. All right. So, you know, and if in your book, if you have something italicized or whatever, look in the margins. It'll tell you. You know, it's Greek or Latin or Hebrew or whatever. Where did that name come from? Because they'll use these same um, prefixes or postfixes later on. So you can always figure out it has something to do with something. Right. So squamous, um, zygomatic process. Right. It's going to be coming around the side of the face. Right. Articulates with the zygomatic bone from the zygomatic arch in the medullary fossa. So look at that. So there's going to be, you know, here it's all color coded. It'll be like the zygomatic arch, zygomatic bone. So as the temporal and the zygomatic come together, they're going to be in that joint, one certain thing. So go in and kind of figure out what the name means or, or the, the area. The name will tell you the area. It'll pinpoint the area. So let's say somebody was, you know, got the thing in a car accident or fell or something and they broke part of this, you would know exactly what they said. Well, they broke the zygomatic arch, wherever. They gave you a direction of swim or a, a measurement. You kind of know where it happened. And there's your temporal mandibular joint, TMJ, because we have a problem with that. Right. Tympanic, all right, this, um, surround the external auditory meatus. Right. So there's your ear. Tympanic is the area all the way around this, all, right. all the way around that. All right. You say, well, I don't know what that means. Well, the tympanic membrane is your, well, you used to call it your eardrum. Now you're going to call it the tympanic membrane, right. which vibrates and moves all those uh, anvil, hammer, all those incus, all the, those bones of the ear to translate all that, the sound waves to nerve impulses. So the petrus houses the middle and internal <clears throat> ear cavities. So this thing I say this is the petrus petrus portion. So this is superior to inferior. Things laying on this. And here's your petrus port petrus portion of that. It's very, very rigid. Very, very uh, peaks. So there's a lot of attachments. So also remember too, <clears throat> your brain is encased in that dura mater, that means tough mother. It is going to have attachment sites to the skull. Um, several foramina, remember those are little holes uh, 
penetrate the peachers for portion. So there's gonna be holes in there. <clears throat> and you can probably see some of them. I could try to maybe transluminate them. Thank God, thanks to the AMT department, I hope they have this pen light on me. So you can probably see some of these holes in here. Right. So the jugular foramen right, allows passage of three cranial nerves. All right, now also, what do you think, out, what else can actually go in the jugular foramen, the jugular artery? All right, carotid canal passage for the internal carotid artery, foramen placerium, and internal acoustic meatus, all right, stylo mastering foramen, cranial nerve passage. All right, so here's your, God, this is beautiful. So I'm excited. I don't know if you guys can see that. I'm illuminating it. I'll illuminate this one. Maybe from the side I can do it. There's like a styloid, a little bony process in there. Right there. The styloid process. All right, so um, or maybe you've seen a, a stylus for a, um, a tablet or back in the day, you guys weren't alive in the, in the 70s and early, well, even 80s and 90s, we had record players, and right, LPs, and there'd be a stylus in there that would go in there. But the stylus and the human body is for the attachment of the tongue muscles. <clears throat> All right, and that the hypoglossal uh, nerve goes through there, cranial nerve 12. It's going to innervate those tongue muscles. So there's a lateral view right in there. There's a styloid process. And then just imagine your tongue is in this area too. All right, so if you were going to rip someone's tongue out, all right, that sounds horrible. All right, if you were to pull on that, there's going to be attachment sites here too, the muscles, the tongue. Right. So there's in the picture. Okay, and then there's a the temporal bone. All right, so I brought this guy here. So. so this would be the temporal bone if we were separated. So there's the temporal bone. So just if we're going to study that bone separately, you know, we're not going to do that, obviously, because the other guys aren't physically here um, in lab. But there's your external auditory meatus. So it gives you a, a point, a ref reference point, all right? And then just realize when you're, when you're ear down, your tongue is right there, too. So you kind of can get an idea. So if you were... Um, well, I guess even if you were quizzed on this or tested on this and someone had, you know, back in the day, we'd have, literally have a pipe cleaner through the, and, you know, we'd have a pipe cleaner through that uh, external auditory meatus and then we'd ask you, you know, if we pointed to this too, we'd say, well, what is this? You have to know this is the temporal bone, that's the external part of the ear. Below that is the tongue. So we'd say, well, we're attached to the stylus. So you know, muscles of the tongue. Oh, perfect. Then once again, there is um, a view inferior to superior, and there's your palatine bone right in this area here. So if you don't remember that well, think of your taste palate, and that's your palate, right? And um, the maxilla, right? So a lot of you probably have burned this, right? Uh, drinking something hot or eating something really, really hot, right? And then as you're going through here, just think about if there's nerves going through here and you've ever been to the dentist, you know, they open wide, they stab a, stab a needle in there and they numb these nerves. And these nerves are what can innervate your teeth. So when they do procedures on your teeth, you don't, luckily you don't feel it, right? So just start learning some of these holes and orientate yourself and figure out what's going through there, right? I said, you don't have to, for right now, know what nerve goes through here per se, but at some point you're gonna to have to, hopefully you have a um, good professor, that they're gonna have you memorize the cranial nerves, 
all right? And generally what they do. I wouldn't expect you to memorize everything they do, but if there's a sensory or motor function, you probably should start learning it now and getting um, familiar with it. And if you're like me, sometimes there's that one or two cranial nerves that no matter how many times you pound your head into it, you just literally forget it or don't remember it. So don't get frustrated. Um, and if you don't remember it, it's just start using process of elimination. Well, I know it's not seven or six or whatever, and I know it's not this, so it has to be, and you'll be able to figure it out. I'm gonna start looking at some of the structures looking down at the skull. And remember, once again, your brain is sitting in this. All right, so just realize anterior, posterior, what's sitting in here, you know, what are some of these functions here? All right. All right, so clinically, the mastoid process contains cavities or sinuses called mastoid air cells. All right, so realize they're taking up space. We have these air cells in here. All right, if they were, they were completely full of osseous tissue, it would be very, very dense. All right, so Sinuses are there for resonation. So uh, if you're hitting a solid block of wood or you're hitting something hollow, there's resonance. It makes the sound of um, or phonation. And once again, and just, I'm gonna to try to transluminate this. So I'm going to look at how thin these portions are. Maybe I can, sorry guys, I just don't have a, anything set up here. So just realize how thin or wisp, they're like almost as thin as tissue paper. So master, uh, mastoiditis, not like um, mastoiditis like cows get, mastoiditis. So mastoid and itis means inflammation can develop in the middle ear, middle ear. And the infection, it, it can spread very easily into the brain because it's so thin, if it breaks through that. If something's inflamed, realize too, there's gonna be inflammation and swelling. If it's uh, in the area or tissue or something that's, that's um, thin and uh, active, it can break through the bone and then we get into the Cerebral spinal fluid, if it gets past the um, meningi separation, it can cause major um, systemic issues in the central nervous system, which is never a good thing. I don't know what I'm doing here. Good grief. All right, sphenoid bone is complex, it's bat shaped bone, right? The Sphenoid sinuses are found within the bone of the sinus. The body also articulates the cella turcica. It includes the hypophysial fossa and encloses the pituitary gland. Right, so I'll try to do this. So there is your cella turcica, right? And that's where your pituitary gland sits. Remember, I said this is actually literally posterior to the glabella. Or your third eye. So in ancient times they would say your third eye is directly um, connected to your uh, pineal gland and that can produce DMT and you know can get into all the specifics of that and we don't have time. All right so when you're looking at this just kind of uh, look and there's a greater wing and lesser wing the pterygoid process. All right, so what's the attachment going to be? What's that for? Just think, start thinking about that. This contains your optic canals, allows passage of the optic nerves, cranial nerve two, goes right to your retina. All right, so if you're going in for uh, an eye exam and they're doing intraocular pressures, they want to check that pressure inside your eye because you have uh, pressure pushing against cranial nerve two, there's no signs or symptoms with that, right? So uh, it's pushing, compressing cranial nerve and starts dying, all right? It's gonna start um, destroying the optic nerve and it'll start destroying um, part of the uh, back of the retina and then where all the photoreceptors are. 
can cause um, major blindness. And once again, there's really generally never any uh, pain with that. You might see some flashing lights or things like that, but these are things you want to um, check. We want to look for that cupping of the retina in the back of the eye. Um, superior orbital fissure, cranial nerve passage, superior orbital fissure. And I literally, I'm pretty sure I put the um, this pipe cleaner through that. All right. Foramen rotundum and foramen ovale also passes ways to the cranial nerves. And when we start talking about the heart, there's also a foramen ovale uh, in embryology so that the right and left atrium blood passes through there because remember the infant, the heart is not beating. So we just want to circulate mom's blood uh, through the, the fetus, all right? And there's a hole there, foramen ovale, that's uh, supposed to be there. But as the child is, when the child's born in infancy, we want that to seal up. We want the atrium to be separate. So sometimes you can have a patent foramen ovale. So they're born with that hole in there. We'll talk about that later. So you'll see this word again when you're talking about um, the septum, atrial septum in the heart. Foramen spinosum is opening for arteries. Right. And there it is. There's the serenoid bone. It doesn't look like a bat. So greater, lesser, pterygoid process. Just kind of um, figure out what, what's there. And, you know, if they see, you know, where is a telus, um, telus circa, or cella tersica set? And you go, oh, well, I remember it was in that bat bone. Oh, wait, it was sphenoid. Ethmoid, and we've all probably heard of ethmoid sinuses, or if you haven't, you have now. Superior part formed by the pair of crimiform plates that also form the roof of the nasal cavity and the floor of the anterior, anterior cranial fossa. So I mean, like, okay, what are they saying here? Superior part um, formed by the crimiform plates and also forms the roof. Just think, well, here's, here's the nose, all right? So I'm just saying, oh, it's gonna be somewhere in this area, all right? Crystal galley. A triangular uh, process that is the point of attachment to the brain's dura mater covering. And I said earlier, a few minutes ago, remember your dura mater is attached to your brain. Right? There's fluid moving around. We just need some kind of anchoring point so it doesn't start shifting, right? You wouldn't think of that, but just realize if things aren't attached, they'll start shifting. And it's very similar to the pericardial sac around your heart, right? It's literally attached to your diaphragm because your heart's beating constantly. So if it wasn't, it would start bouncing all over your thoracic cavity. Have you ever played uh, something called like tetherball? Right, so the heart would be bouncing all over. You need to attach that um, inferiorly to the diaphragm. All right, the perpendicular plate. So remember, perpendicular. So perpendicular. Form superior part of the nasal septum is flanked by the lateral. So this is perpendicular here. Lateral is going to be on either side, right? Contain the ethmoid air sinuses. All right, the lateral masses extend medially to form the superior, uh, middle, and nasal conche. So just you know, look in your book and, and realize what's going on in here. All right, there's going to be sinuses up in here. All right, and if any of you have ever had sinus infection or known someone with a sinus infection, it can be very, very painful. It's going to be located to be frontal ethmoid. In here, these sinuses can fill with fluid. Right, and there's a lot, a lot of pressure. So there's the ethmoid bone. Extremely complicated, but look at how thin that is. Right, and just realize, well, what's going on in the ethmoid bone? Well, that looks kind of like the middle of your face. So it would be where your sinuses are, and there's um, conchi in here, lateral masses would be here, the lateral. It's, you guys know directional terms, right? Orbital plate. All right, because your nose is here, the orbit's up here, so you're figuring, well, your eyes are going to be in here somewhere. All right, and right here's your crystal gallery. Remember, the, the dura mater attaches here, all right? But if you've ever seen um, <clears throat> some of these uh, violent movies I don't like to watch, but if you could, you, you break someone's nose and shove this portion up right into the brain, all right, you hit it just right, you're shoving this right up into the brain. All right, can cause instantaneous death. All right, and there's another um, anterior view. Right. 
you guys can study this however you want. When I was in grad school, I had a CD called Netter. You could go in and you could blank things, Netter, it's by Netter, N-E-T-T-E-R. Fantastic um, artist and MD. But I could go in and I could get a picture of this and I could blank these all out, go in and type it, and it would tell me if I was right or wrong, and I did it continuously. Or I would make copies and I would cover it all up and then I'd write it all out and, and check myself over and over again. And I'd always, there'd be something I'd always forget or couldn't get into my head. <clears throat> so there's another view, uh, superior to inferior. So just kind of, um, when you're doing this, get your orientation, anterior, posterior, and start learning or start thinking, well, I, you know, I haven't learned the brain yet, but this is the frontal area, this is posterior, this is lateral, um, medial, I know the ears are over here, sinuses is here, eyes are here. Just start orientating yourself um, to what's going on. Don't just look at this picture and try to memorize that. I mean, you could try that. I wouldn't be my method, but um, we all learn differently, right? All right, sutural bones. So sutures, like if you're talking about it's um, surgery, we're gonna stitch someone up with sutures, all right? The sutural bones here, this is probably the best. This helps when it's the worst. I'll just the cameras up here. Sutural bones. Okay. Sutural bones. Sutural bones. All right, so there's sutures in there. You can see, you'll see pictures of it coming up. Tiny irregular shape, bones that appear within sutures, significance is unknown, as not everybody has these. All right. Um, these literally, um, from the foramen uh, fontanel, all right, the baby, the soft spot, I do have a real baby skull here, but I don't wanna go pull it out as it's getting really brittle. Um, you know, a baby has the fontanel, it's a very soft spot in the brain. So as that starts filling in, these sutures will start coming together, right? They're saying significance unknown, uh, as not everybody has these, but there's there's something called craniosacral technique, and sometimes they can go in and they can, um, it's a little bit esoteric, but they can go in and manipulate these uh, sutures and get them moving again, all right, and get that cerebrospinal fluid moving over. So the sig the um, significance of these are really they're like um, little seismic plates or things. And, uh, Sanders fault lines, there's you know, they can start regulating uh, pressure and regulate movement. Right, so here's a sagittal suture, there's your lambdoidal suture again, caused by the, the shape, all right, lambda, right, occipital bone, superior nuchal line, inferior, and just remember these are their set attachment sites for ligaments and muscles of the, the neck and um, part of the neck there. So the facial bones, there's a mandible, right? so you guys know, should know that, the lower part of your jaw. Maxillary bone, all right, maxillary is up in here, the upper portion where your teeth are. Zygomatic bone, remember they're gonna be over here. Nasal bone, lacrimal bone, so think about lacrimal. Lacrimal, so just start thinking tears, so where do you think those would be located? Palatine bones, all right, the balmer in the center part of the nose, inferior nasal conchi, there's two of those. So the mandible is the strongest bone of the face. All right, and if you don't, if you don't believe that, just think of somebody who's having a, um, a seizure, they have a uh, lockjaw. So sometimes when people have a seizure, those muscles contract so hard, they can fracture the, the mandible and they can, they can actually crack the teeth. Right. That's how strong this um, bone of the face is. U-shaped lower jaw bone made of the upper body. All right, it's kind of U-shaped. Right. Um, <clears throat> two upper remus. So the mandible, so temporal mandibular joint, mandible, is the point where the rami and chin meet. All right, there's a coronoid process, all right? So this is the superior end of the rami, serves as an insertion point for large temporalis muscle. So remember, this temporalis is over here. And 
just not to confuse you, but there's a coronoid process here and there's a coracoid process in the scapula. Right? So try not to get those two mixed up. The conjular process is posterior to the coronary, forms part of the temporal mandibular joint. Right? Body consists of the alveolar process. Right? So maybe I can show you one on here. Right. And there, I've got a. All right, I've got a pipe cleaner in that. It will process that contains sockets for teeth and the mandibular symphysis uh, ridge. All right, and the alveolar process, these are actually a specific type of a joint called a gomphosis. Um, I've seen that question quite a bit. Some random fact that I expect you guys to remember. But anyway, uh, foramina include mandibular for nerves and the mental foramen for nerves and blood vessels. So just learn those points. There's going to be um, uh, foramina for nerves, the mental um, foramen for nerves and blood vessels. Right. So there's a mental foramen. Right. And these are lateral. Right, so there's some of the conjular process here. The rami is that little arch area, right, mandibular angle. All right, your jawbone. You know, if you say, you know, somebody has a really, really distinct jawbone. All right, they're talking about the mandible. All right, the maxillary or the upper portion immediately fused to form the upper jaw and central facial skeleton, right? And just the other thing too, think about this. Um, I'll try to do this too, I'll try to translate it like this. So any of you that are going into, you know, dental or whatever, just realize that the, the sinuses are above this in here. We just learned about that too. So if you're gonna have some kind of a, um, titanium implant or you need some something done or a root canal, just realize that those are really, really, really close to the sinuses. So sometimes you go to have one of these upper teeth uh, replaced with a titanium um, post or an implant. Sometimes they have to literally go in and they have to build up the bone area. So they might go in and um, remember we talked about osteo blast and osteoclast and all this stuff. So then you actually, they, they'll go in and they'll, it's really kind of cool. They, they'll pull growth factor from your blood, right? And they'll go in and they can pack it with um, osteocytes or they can use, uh, not to be gross, but they can use sterilized cadaver bone. So you have the components there and they can have you build up that bone area. So when they go to put the titanium post in, they have something to anchor it to. Side. Right. <clears throat> so this anterior uh, postal spine forms just below the nose. So just kind of think of, you know, you're in here on the maxillary bone. So start visualizing, you know, either from here or what, or what view you need to do. And a lot of you can go out, you can get 3D animations of this stuff too. Uh, stuff that was not available for me when I was taking this. Right, there's a frontal process, so realize, well, I know what the frontal bone is, I know uh, anterior from posterior, and to give you an idea of where that is located. Zygomatic process, right, so there's a zygomatic, all right, and there's a the maxillary. So I would say it's going to be some, sorry, somewhere over in that area, right? Openings for nerve and blood vessels, and we'll see a picture of that from the, um, we'll be viewing it from inferior to superior on the palate. And there you'll start looking and seeing some of these openings. All right, inferior oral fissure, that should be easy to figure out. Inter or infraorbital foramen, and then incisive fossa and canal. So where are your incisors? Think about that for a second, right? Okay, so is the infra orbital foramen, right? Here's the orbital surface. So just think, well, wait a minute, that's where the eye's gonna be, right? The eye's gonna be there. 
uh, this articulates with the frontal bone, which are frontal sinuses. And a lot of times, if you, like I said, if you have somebody or know somebody or you suffer from sinus infections when the weather changes or uh, you get some kind of uh, bacterial infection in your uh, upper respiratory tract, this can be very, very uh, painful. And I used to work with a, a woman who would literally, she'd have hot coffee on her forehead or on the side of her face whenever she had a sinus infection. Loosen it up, I guess, and then she told me. All right, zygomatic bones. These form the cheekbones and inferior uh, margins of the orbits. And I said, well, where was the zygom zygomatic arch? So we're gonna be talking about the zygomatic in this. All right, <clears throat> nasal bones, they form the bridge of your nose. And we all know uh, by ethnicity that they're all generally a little bit different, all right? Not any of us have the same exact nose structure. Very, very unique. Ears are very, very different. And you know, the other really cool thing, if you, if you look at, pictures of people from um, when they're children to adults, you'll look, their ears are completely different, their nose is completely different. So, you know, we're thinking, well, did the bone really remodel? Because we said before that during, um, oh wait, the writing reflex, yeah, was the, um, for the eyes on the horizon. So according to Wolf's Law, your bones are going to remodel every seven years. So you realize that your osteoblast and osteoclast are remodeling all that, but sometimes, they can change in shape depending on, your bones can change in shape depending on what kind of um, shearing forces are put on them. And the cartilage in your ear can change too. Like it starts to ossify as you get older, so it can, it can change some of these things. And you'll notice, if you look at um, people as they get older, um, you know, think, do all the dirt ears really get bigger or did everything around it get smaller? So it's just, sorry, think about that. So that was a side note, I lost my train of thought. Uh, all right, so nasal bones form the bridge of your nose, articulate with the frontal, maxillary, and ethmoid bones. So like I said, again, when you're looking at these or picturing this, what are they articulating with? What are the boundaries? So think of it as a, like a state, I said. What other states or what other landmarks are surrounding that bone, right? So attached to cartilage that forms the tip of the nose, all right, so you know it's, it should be relatively flexible. Uh, lacrimal bones forms the medial walls of the orbits. So lacrimal, I said lacrimal, you know, tears are lacrimal fluid. Articulate with the frontal, maxillary, and ethmoid bones. Lacrimal fossa that houses a lacrimal sac allows passage for tears to drain. And if you don't believe me, if you've ever uh, seen somebody cry or you've ever cried for something, um, tears of joy or happiness or anger or whatever, um, it's draining somewhere, right? So it's draining right into your, your nose or into the mouth if you're really, really crying. You know, there's all those things called punctate in the eyes that drain some of the tears and somebody has a dry eye that can actually go in and block those. They can put little um, silicone or wax plugs in there. Uh, you know, as people get older, their eyes get dry, they can only go in and they start blocking that drainage. So it keeps the tears on the cornea. All right, so there's a side view showing you all the, the bones and just start thinking, you know, I know it's hard and it's a lot, but start thinking about 3D structures or what is deep to that or what is, that's the outside wall, so what's behind it? Palatine bone, L-shaped bone, um, <clears throat> made from two bony uh, plates. These are actually plates. There's a horizontal plate, remember, horizontal is always this direction. Uh, posterior one third of the hard palate. All right, so palate, that means it's my mouth, or the hard palate would be, um, oh, probably the back, right? It's the part where your tongue actually can't reach all the way back. The perpendicular plate forms part of the posterior, posterior lateral. So posterior lateral, 
forgive me, the orientation right there. Walls of the nasal cavity and <clears throat> small parts of the orbit. So just realize, that, you know, small part of the orbit is back here. It's gonna, it's gonna um, make a small portion of that. The vulnar is a plow, plow shaped uh, bone, forms part of the nasal septum. So there's that vulnar. You kind of look, it's plow shape, all right? And there's that palatine bone, the horizontal plate. All right, our perpendicular is going to be going in this orientation. All right, so just start, you know, start thinking through here, like what will horizontal would be going this way, perpendicular is going, going this way, and there's your orientation. You're doing a sagittal cut right there. So the inferior nasal contrary. So contrary are going to be, um, uh, you think of any of those uh, conch shells, where, you know, you're supposed to can hear the ocean in them. So they're, that's how they kind of got their name by that shape. A pair of bones that form part of the lateral walls of the nasal cavity, largest of three bones of the contrary. The ethmoid bone forms the other two pairs. So when you're looking at the ethmoid bone or that, that area, start orientating yourself to that. The hyoid bone, so this is one bone, is there for um, part of your tongue muscles to attach to, all right? It's free floating, it's the only bone in the body that doesn't uh, attach to other, it doesn't articulate with any other bone, all right? Lies in the anterior neck, inferior to the mandible. Right? It's not a bone of the skull, it's just kind of sitting there free formed, it's, it's kind of uh, U-shaped. Only bone that does not articulate directly with another bone, it's anchored by ligaments. Okay? Right, so ligaments anchor bone to bone, but don't actually attach, but they're, they're attached by ligaments. Acts as a movable base for the tongue and site of attachment for muscles for swallowing and speech. So it's just gonna just free floating in there with ligaments and bone, muscles attached to it so they have something to pull against, right? And this is the bone uh, that gets broken if someone is strangled, right? Somebody's strangled, they go in and they actually crush that bone. All right, so if you look where it is, lesser horn, greater horn. So this is going to be where the ligaments are attaching. So we have something stable. So when the um, tongue muscles contract, they have something to, to hold up, hold on to. So we have some shearing forces. Um, all right. So the orbits are cavities that encase the eyes and lacrimal glands. Lacrimal glands, once again, these are what's going to make your tears. Sites of attachment for eye muscles. Right. Um, and then, okay, uh, we'll talk about the muscle later and um, superior lateral and eyes that or medial lateral or lateral rectus or these muscles that actually cause the eyes to move back and forth. And then one's going to be on this little pulley, and we'll see that. Sites of attachment for eye muscles form, formed by parts of uh, seven bones, and there's the seven bones there. So you could go in and look at your. <clears throat> You know, go in and look at the colored pictures, and you'll see you know, all the different colors in there, and that all these bones articulate and they form the orbit. Uh, I certainly would never ask you guys that. That's crazy. But if you look, that is a fact. That's what it would look like in the in the real skull. Totally does remind me of Ahmed. So. <clears throat> so there's an actual close up, right? and there's all the different bones. All right, but just like I said, when you're going and looking at this, I know it's going to take a little more time, but repetition is the key. Once again, optic canal, well, what's going through there? Right? Superior orbital fissure. Well, why would I need this great big area? In my spine. Posterior to my eye, what's going through there? You know, what, what's coming through the uh, infraorbital foramen? Well, what's located in that area? Is that going to be a nerve? Is it going to be blood? In the nasal cavity, 
formed by um, parts of several bones. Right? So when you're going in, you're looking like the nasal cavity in here, posterior. And right, so, you know, what is the roof, the portion? Well, there's the nose. So if I were to go in through here, what am I, I'm up against, sorry, I'm up against something up in here. So there's a lateral view of what's going on here. There it is. Okay. Yeah, lateral walls are superior middle contract the ethmoid, perpendicular plates. Right. Spaces between the contract are called meatuses. A meatus is always a space, so fissure, uh, foramen, you know, all of these spaces, and they're not there for um, no reason, right? So conchi increase the turbulence of the airflow, right? The floor is process of the palatine and maxillary bones, you know, the floor and your sinuses. The nasal septum, that portion that divides it from left to right, and you've, I'm sure you've all heard of people with a deviated septum. All right, so if somebody has a deviated septum, they usually have trouble breathing or their voice sounds a little weird. Or a big um, problem with that is they'll go to sleep laying on their side and then one side of their sinuses will get all plugged up and they have to flip over and let the other side um, will drain and then the other side gets plugged up. It's a constant battle back and forth where all this fluid goes in the sinuses if they're deviating and causing major, major problems with um, pressure gradients and all kinds of crazy stuff. So anterior formed by the septal cartilage. Remember cartilage is rigid, but it is a little bit pliable, right? So when they go and do the sept, uh, nasal surgery, or they used to, they would go in and sometimes they have to break it completely and they, they shove these molds up in there and they can literally sew them together and then it can be weeks or months when it reheals, we re, um, reconstruct that sinus or that, that um, lumen right, so that people have a much easier way of um, breathing. All right. Paranasal, so para usually means around or side of formed by five skull bones, right, all contain, there's a key, they all contain mucus lined air filled spaces. Right? So anything that's external to your body, any, any part of your body that is in contact with the external environment and your, your nose is because you're breathing in external air. These are mucus lined, right? so we want mucus there. Remember too, anything that's mucus lined usually has um, IgA, immunoglobin A, antibodies in it. Very, very important. I mean, functions warms and humidifies the air. Just think about that. What if you were outside, you know, specifically in Buffalo in February and it was 10 below zero and you breathed in really quick and there was nothing to warm that air. By the time it got to your um, alveolar in your lungs, it could potentially freeze the alveolar, all right, and they would die. They really uh, be dead. It wouldn't regenerate very, very well. It helped to lighten the skull. You want that solid bone there and enhance resonance of voice. So when your sinuses get um, plugged or full of fluid, your voice changes. And you all know when you have a cold, your voice changes. That's just from swelling of the nasal um, cavities. The mucus line cavities can swell and change the uh, they swell and it, it diminishes the room uh, and the lumen. So there's your maxillary sinuses, there's your ethmoid sinuses, right? And these can be painful too. Right? And then the frontal sinuses, right? So I, um, I think I can do that. Maybe. Yeah. But you can, if you, you know, if you suspect somebody has a sinus infection or it's fluid, you can turn the, you can turn the lights off somewhere and you can actually go up and you can transilluminate 
these sinuses and see what's going on with the patient. All right, guys, I'm going to end that for today. So that was probably like an hour and a half. I'll just get, I guess what I'm going to do is I'm going to just start making more and more of these. It's just easier if I do it here at school. I have the model that I'm going to be doing at 6.30 at night on Mondays. I will check in with everyone or if you need to um, Zoom meeting with me, uh, we can do it whenever you want or I can check in with you guys. Um, quickly on Mondays at 6.30 if you want. So just let me know. Um, I think my thought process right now is the holidays are coming up. We just had a traumatic week. Um, I'm sure you all hopefully, um, you know, we're going to deal with whatever the, the situation is. Um, however, uh, it came out. Um, so let's get back to work. And uh, a &P one literally is probably one of the hardest courses you'll take because there's a tremendous, tremendous amount of information. Um, use whatever resource you have, Google. Um, you have, you all have a mastering, tremendous resource. You've got those worksheets. Um, you know, I know you have to put them out. I can't give them to you, unfortunately. Just go in and figure them out. So the information should be in your book and you know, if it's matching or whatever process of elimination. So just start getting in the thought process of doing it. And um, I know it's not fun, but just um, remember if you're resistant to something, it's really just um, your uh, subconsciously, your unwillingness to expand, right? Or get better at something. So whenever you have resistance, that's just, your ego or whatever, just um, showing you your unwillingness or your not volitionally want to, to, expand, to expand. All right, those are my words of wisdom for today. All right, um, let me end this here and